the Rockies are right over there. Don't just go to the conference. Go and see the Rocky Mountain National Park. Go hiking up at Bear Lake or something. Don't do what I did, which is just to come for the conference. Go and see the area. Uh, thank you for coming to the unit test strike back. Uh, I'm Dave Steffen. I'm a principal software engineer at SciTech. We are a small company. We work in uh, national defense and security. Uh, we are hiring. We've got an office uh, up in Boulder. For those of you who don't know Colorado, uh, if you like the view out west from all the big windows here, we're even closer. So you might consider checking us out. Um, uh, last year, I gave kind of a strange talk claiming that science and unit testing were kind of the same thing. <laughs> unit tests are basically an empirical laboratory test examining a physical system, which is a computer running your code, for a particular property, like does it have bugs. Um, I don't know if that was a really successful talk or not, but I got a lot of really good questions afterwards, mainly from people who had some horrible problem trying to test their code and they wanted advice. And at the time, all I could really say was, ooh, yeah, that sounds hard. Good luck with that. So I thought this year I would actually try to come, it, come up with some good advice for what happens when the unit tests that you're trying to write don't work out quite so well. Um, and what I found that, on the whole, it's not pretty. It's not pretty at all. Um, so it isn't really that this talk is full of good advice. This talk is about how to throw out the good advice and about all the bad advice that you should take when the situation gets even worse. Um, it, it is Friday at CPPCon. I think people are awake. Uh, I will point out that the big advantage of giving a talk on the Friday of CPPCon is you've got all week to be talking to people, to seeing the good, uh, the, the good talks, uh, getting ideas from people. Um, the bad part of that is that you spend all week revising your slides. Um, I had a great conversation with uh, Pete Muldoon Sunday night, which totally replaced the middle third of this. I, I think I've got everything worked out. Um, so before we dive into this, um, just as a quick review, what are the properties of good unit tests? If all goes well, what do we get? So from the science point of view, we get a lab instrument that is precise. It distinguishes between good and bad. It can distinguish between different kinds of failure. It can tell you precisely what went wrong and where. Um, you want it to be accurate, which is to say its state reflects reality. If your code doesn't have bugs, it turns green. If your code has bugs, it turns red. And you want it to be reproducible. That's the foundation of science, right? Every time you run, you run it, you get the same answer. When your coworkers run it, they get the same answer. From a more traditional software engineering point of view, you typically get a list. This may not be complete, but uh, something like this. You want your test to be complete. You want it to cover all your code. You want it to be maintainable. Uh, robust to change, robust to maintenance, robust to all the crazy things that go on. Uh, you want them to be reliable, readable. Remember, unit tests don't get unit tested, which means that they pretty much just get tested by inspection, so they'd better be really readable. Um, uh, and you want them to be hermetic. You don't want them to be, to be leaking bits in and out. Um, and the way that you get to tests with those properties is pretty much all the good advice that you've been hearing about now for years and years and years. Use test-driven development, uh, test using behavior-driven principles, test only the public interface, uh, design for testability. Um, and of course, there's a whole subset of stuff to know about how to handle legacy code. Uh, see Brian Ruth's talk earlier this week. Um, we didn't plan this. The second part of this talk is kind of a continuation of his talk um, with some big differences. Um, but anyway, this is the plan for getting the unit test you want. And you can see 
uh, the, the number of good talks at CPPCon and the other conferences. Last year, we had a whole track on testing. Um, go back to, I think, 2017, Fedor Picus gave what I think is a great talk in the Back to Basics track. I found out recently that that's controversial and some people really don't like it. I like it, we can go argue, all right? Um, if you want to go way back to, I think, 2015, uh, Titus Winters and Hiram Wright gave a very entertaining talk called All Your Tests Are Terrible, all right? And that's just like the top five. I'm not even sure they're the top five. There are books and books and books and blogs and blog posts and podcasts. So there's plenty of good advice out there. And so the plan for getting the test you want is you follow all that advice. There's a problem, which is that we all know what happens to plans when they hit reality? Right? It never works out that nicely. Okay? This is from my favorite online comic called Schlock Mercenary. This is a grand space opera, aliens, spaceships, galaxy-wide conflict. Here our intrepid heroes are about to head off on a re another ill-fated rescue mission. And this pretty much describes exactly what's going to happen to us. Uh, Plan A is also known as a blade of armor that will fail to protect plan B, which will take a bullet for plan C, which is why we need more letters. If plan A is follow all that good advice, what's plan B? Now, if you go back and watch Brian's talk from earlier this week, he had the same lighting scheme on stage that we've got now. It's this nice green. His talk was a very hopeful talk. He's talking about all the horrible problems you have with legacy code because it's a problem. The fundamental problem with legacy code is that it typically doesn't have tests, which means you can't change it safely. But you can't write tests until you change it, and now what? Um, this is not that talk. Can we, can we change the color scheme here? Yeah. Um, it's almost Halloween. And this is the scary horror movie. And it isn't that we don't have hope, because usually at least one person is alive at the end. But this is going to get a little ugly, OK? Uh, the point is, is that plan A is fine. You've got plan A. You can go out to battle with plan A. But when plan A vaporizes into a cloud of expanding monatomic gas, what's next? And the two principles we have here is that, first of all, any test is better than no test, with very few exceptions. I have seen one case where a test had negative value, and that was an extremely dysfunctional situation that I don't want to talk about. Um, and the point is that if your plan is we can't test it, you need a better plan, because otherwise it's not going to work out well. So uh, this isn't a hard and fast rule, but just as a way mentally to approach the problem, you can usually localize where the problem's coming from as either it's the testing that's hard or it's the code that's hard. Where is the problem in your testing coming from? If your problems are coming from management, I can't help you. That's OK. But it's usually one of these two with a gray area in between. Um, I had a whole bunch of stuff on the gray area in between, which I took out because Pete Mildoon's problem was more interesting. Um, so let's, let's dive into part one. The problem here is that it's hard to test or something is wrong with the tests that you've got or that you're trying to develop. Um, and uh, the, the two most common, well, the most common situation is that you've got flaky tests. You've got some test somewhere that just randomly fails for reasons no one understands. How many of you have leaky, or rather flaky test? Oh my god. Yeah, right? OK. <laughs> you know whereof I speak. Um, roughly speaking, this is either coming from your code or your test. You've got some non-deterministic behavior. And it might be in the unit test itself. Maybe your code's fine. But the code's the problem. The second case is when you've got environmental dependencies. Your code is leaking bits in and out, and the thing to which it is talking goes down or has a problem. We'll get to that here in a minute. Um, the point is, uh, this is Titus Winters 
your test should fail because the code under test fails and for no other reason, which is just another way of saying what the scientists know. You have to isolate your experiment from the rest of the universe, otherwise you don't know what the answers mean. So, um, we are talking about buggy non-determinism. Um, we're not talking about code that's supposed to be non-deterministic, right? If you've got some code that uses a random number generator, you're supposed to get a different answer every time. That's the point. That's not a bug, that's do it doing what it's supposed to do. Or what if your code is a random number generator? Or what if it's something that hooks up to a piece of hardware that is an entropy source because you need really good random numbers? Um, that's not what we're talking about. You can handle those simply by really understanding what it is for this thing to be working and what it looks like. Clearly generating a specific set of numbers is not the answer you're looking for. You have to run it a million times and do all the statistics and make sure the uniform is, you know, the, the distribution is uniform and all that stuff. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is that it's supposed to be deterministic and it's not. You've got undefined behavior someplace. For undefined behavior, if you want to know more about that, uh, go see Barbara and Ansel's talk a couple of days ago. Um, if you really want to get into it, uh, Chandler Carruth gave a great talk uh, several years ago at CppCon where he's jumping up and down about it from a compiler developer's point of view. Um, we all know that undefined behavior is a problem, so plan A is obvious. Go fix your code. Go fix the code. What's the problem? Um, put your hands up again if you've got a flaky test that's been around for a while. Uh, or Actually, you don't have to. You may be embarrassed. It's okay. There's cameras. I know you're out there. Look, there's a lot of reasons why people don't fix their damn code, all right? Um, first of all, it's hard. We wouldn't have all these talks about undefined behavior if it was easy to go find. The other point is that unit tests for code that is known to be good, in scare quotes, for other reasons, tends to have a low return on investment. If the thing is working, and it's been working in production for years, eh? It's obviously good enough, right? How much money do you want to spend on this? Um, or honestly, it's just not annoying enough to justify the time you're going to spend on it. Okay, fair enough. Plan A goes down. Plan B is what you're doing now, probably, which is you just ignore it and live with it. It's annoying. Every now and then it happens. Eh. Um, what you're really doing is incorporating the occasional failure into your process, maybe officially, probably unofficially, in that you tell the new person on your team, that thing over there, when that fails, yeah, don't worry about it, just run it again, it's okay. Uh, there are some real problems with this. I probably don't have to convince you of that. First of all, how many of you have a development process in which your unit tests run as part of the build? If you got a unit test that fails, your build fails. That's a whole lot of people, okay? How many of you have a process in which you can't even merge or put it up for a code review if the build is broken? That's the same people, right? So if your test fails, you have to run everything again in order to put it up for review or to merge it, and the rest of your team is waiting on this. It interferes with your development process, and you know that this is going to happen at 11 o'clock at night the night before a delivery at some point. It's inevitable. That's the time when you actually know that is not the most likely time for undefined behavior to rear its head. The most likely time for undefined behavior to rear its ugly head is when you are demoing to the customer. Yeah. You also have the boy who cried wolf syndrome. Maybe something happened and you did break it, but now it just fails 20% of the time instead of 5% of the time. Um, Pete's example, he's got something that he runs 5,000 times and on average it fails three. All right. If it suddenly starts failing 10% of the time, you probably want to go look, but you're not going to notice it. Um, the thing that really scares me, though, is this one on the bottom. Your developers are losing a key survival skill in our industry, right? You want your developers to have an instinct and a reflex that says when something breaks in the build, they twitch very quickly. Back in the day, we had good survival reflexes about every time you see a new or a malloc, you go find the free because you know there's a, there's a bug right back in, in the dark days before the shared pointers, right? Um, 
you really don't want to blunt your developer's survival skills like this because they're going to get used to it. Something turns red and yeah, I don't care about it. Don't do that. So plan C, uh, manage the flakiness. Um, you gather statistics on how and when it fails. Maybe it only fails every Thursday afternoon, in which case you might go investigate that. Or you do what Pete does where you run it a million times and you just know how many times it fails on average. He's, it's a race condition somewhere. And then you rework your tests to define pass as it matches the known statistics. So that if it changes its behavior, at least something shows up and you know you better go look at it. All right? You are now habituating your testing framework to the flakiness, not your developers. Why would this not work? Mainly because this takes more work. It's time and effort. Now, we've already gone past the option where you're just going to ignore it. So the only other thing I've got if that goes down is you're going to abandon the unit test. You're just going to turn it off. This is plan omega. It's the last plan. We're going to come back to that at the end. It's not good, but you're not dead yet. Now, the other case where you get flakiness is in uh, non-hermetic code where the thing you're testing is supposed to talk to some external thing. Um, part of David Sankel's excellent talk last night was pointing out that if your code does this, it kind of isn't a unit test and it's certainly problematic. But at some point, you're going to write code that has to communicate on a socket, hit a database, hit a server, write to a file system, communicate with some custom piece of hardware, whatever it is. And the problem, uh, well, aside from the fact that maybe it isn't a unit test anymore, strictly speaking, although it still might be a good candidate for being tested by your unit test framework, um, you still got to test it. Um, and just practically, this is annoying, okay? Uh, you get the flaky or non-reproducible results because the thing out there failed. Um, your code's fine, but something fails. Um, it's also just annoying because it ties your development and build and CI pipeline environment to whatever the thing is, uh, which there's all kinds of reasons why you might not like to do that, or maybe you just can't. Um, so the obvious thing here to do, plan A, is restore hermeticity with a mock or a double or something, right? Don't use the real thing. Put some fake thing in place that is local and is within your executable, and then use that. There's a lot of good reasons to do this. Maybe the real objects are non-deterministic. They're hard to set up. It's hard to trigger the behavior in them that you need to trigger to do the complicated test. They're slow. They have got a physical user interface that you have to go push a button. Maybe they don't exist yet. They're under development, uh, so forth. Um, plan A. But there are plenty of failure modes to this, too. Uh, mocks are expensive to make. They're difficult to hook in. They need independent testing. Please don't write a mock. Write the unit test that uses the mock. Decide that your mock is correct because the test passes, and then decide that your code is correct because the test passes. Don't do that. Um, mocks are notoriously hard to use and to hook in. They're really annoying. They can be very unrealistic. Um, I'm going to steal Titus and Hiram's joke about you've got a unit test that needs to test the world, so you need the whole Earth to run your test, but uh, the, the Earth is notoriously hard to set up. It takes days. It's not my joke. So you use a flat Earth, uh, and then you launch your rocket, and you get a uh, very unpleasant uh, uh, surprise. Um, go back and see Peter Summerlad a couple of years ago, mocking frameworks considered harmful. Uh, two years ago at C++ Now, Chris Jusiak gave a talk on dependency injection, which is the usual standard way to put a mock into your system. Uh, and he goes through all the various contortions that it takes to do that. So you might not want to use mocks. Uh, plan B is that you abandon the hermeticity, but if you can, you embrace locality. Whatever this external thing is, just make it ubiquitous. Make it, if you can, set up so it's just everywhere. It's on everyone's development environment. It's in all the build systems. It's just there, which means maybe you have to invest in getting some resources for that. The, on the basis that if it's reliable, which means it's local and you can make sure it's up and running, your test will be reliable. Um, this has got its failure modes too, which is that you can't do this, basically. This doesn't really 
answer most of the problems on that previous slide. But if you can do it, great. We actually did this uh, not too long ago. My team was working on a thing. We were talking to Zookeeper, uh, which is uh, an open source thing from the Apache people. It's kind of a distributed, real simple data. It's the, the distributed equivalent of a standard map. And we actually started by mocking it because we grabbed the headers and made a copy of them and then like put all our mock stuff in there and you know did compiler flags to flip which header file, yeah, yeah okay. After a while I found out none of my developers were using that, they were just running it on their system because it's really easy to run and it doesn't take up a lot of resources, just run it. Um, so that works, but maybe you can't do that. Plan C. This is plan B from the previous option. You, it's non-hermetic and you live with it and it's flaky and eh, right? Bunch of you guys are there now. It's not a good option. It's an option. Um, and these are all the same failure modes we had earlier. Um, in this case, we've got a different plan D. In principle, at least, you can build some independent sensors that will detect if the thing is there and you, and you can talk to it and it's working. And then you have your unit tests hooked into those or the other way around. So at least your unit test system or your build pipeline knows when you can't run your tests. And you rig it so that it runs all the other tests, but you don't run those because you know they're gonna fail. Um, now, first of all, this is also expensive. Recurring theme, testing is expensive. Um, you also need to make sure that whatever those sensors are are highly reliable or you just added some extra flaky. You put in flaky, you haven't taken it out. And you will remember if you're a little older with all the shuttle launches, I mean, it still happens now, but the shuttle launches were always getting scrubbed because some valve wasn't doing something and they'd go in and look and it, the valve was fine, it was the sensor, right? You don't want flaky sensors. Um, and you've still got the other problems uh, with the disruption to your development cycle, but now you've got this other weird thing where You've now got three results from your unit tests. It passes, it fails, and I couldn't run it. I don't know. What does that mean in a build pipeline? Do you merge or not, right? So you're gonna have to at least go think about what you do under that situation. Uh, and if plan D goes down, we go back to plan omega, you abandon the test, you turn it off, you do something else. So uh, just to summarize this first part, for non-deterministic code, you fix it, you live with it, or you rig your tests to hide the whatever it is so that you don't see it and you still get pass-fail results. Uh, for uh, dealing with external and unreliable dependencies, you can mock it, you can make it local and ubiquitous so it isn't a problem, or again, you either decide to just live with it or you put in instrumentation so that you know when your test would not be expected to work. How are we doing? Oh, we got plenty of time. Um, all right, now that's part one. Um, any questions at this point? Things haven't gotten horrible yet. They'll get horrible. Anything online? Okay, good. On we go. Uh, oh, I <laughs> forgot. Um, there is a silver lining to this, by the way. If this is interfering with your development process because you can't merge things, um, keep track of how much that's costing your team because that's really good ammo to take to management when you need to go ask for additional resources for testing. Always good to have numbers. It just cost you this much. All right, uh, let's get on to part two, which is much more unpleasant. Um, here the difficulty in testing lies in the structure or the layout of the code. This is mostly uh, legacy code. Not always, there, there are some cases where it's not legacy code, but usually this is legacy code. Um, see again that talk, that, that talk earlier. Um, we're gonna do the simplest example ever. Uh, and you know that all, all slide code at conferences is stupid because it has to fit on the screen and you have to be able to read it quickly. And all examples have to be super, super simple because we don't wanna spend 20 minutes describing some complicated thing to you. So let's build vector from scratch. Now, you wouldn't do this. We've already got one. Um, and it turns out this isn't the simplest example around either. Go see David Stone's talk a couple of days ago about how interesting it is to actually build a custom vector. It's non-trivial. But anyway, say you're doing this yourself. 
but for some reason, you didn't put in capacity. So whatever resizing you're gonna do, the thing's full, you push back, it's gotta grow, all that business, you can't really test it. You can't test that behavior via the public interface because it doesn't have one. Um, so plan A in this case would have been you don't get into this case because you've been using test-driven development and you could not have written the thing without a way to test it. So, hey, you couldn't have gotten here in the first place. Now, aside from the fact that test-driven development is a whole lot harder to do than it sounds, um, go see any of Phil Nash's talks or take his classes or all kinds of other classes online. Um, the obvious case is legacy code. Uh, or, well, maybe it isn't legacy, legacy code, but someone else built this. You're all CPPCon attendees. You would not have been so silly as to leave this out. But those yokels down the hall, they get up to all kinds of stuff, right? So maybe they goofed and now you gotta fix it. Or, I, look, people add things in a hurry during maintenance. It happens. Um, more interestingly, maybe it's a bad design to do this, or at least you think it is. Maybe this looks like you're exposing innards of a class that you should not be exposing. So you didn't want to, all right? So plan A goes down. Plan B is just to fix the interface, right? It's the simplest thing you'd possibly do, put it in. Now, again, for this case, we know perfectly well that it belongs there, right? Don't be silly. Um, you can't always do this. First of all, it might be hard if you got some complicated bit of internal business going on. Coming up with a public interface for it might be challenging. If that's the case, you have other design problems, but it's legacy code, of course you have other design problems. But again, we come back to that's a bad design. You shouldn't be exposing that. You're increasing the interface of your class, and we all know what Hiram's Law says, and this really is something you don't want anyone depending on, you're gonna go change it as soon as you get the chance. Now, you're probably wrong because one of the things we have learned over the past 10 or 15 years is that good design is testable and testable design is good code. The other thing I will point out is you have to ask if it's worse than the alternatives. All right, wait for five minutes. But maybe, maybe you don't wanna do this, all right? There is another option, at least in principle, which is that what you're running up against is a design mistake, you violated the single responsibility rule, right? S in solid. Maybe the reason this thing didn't have a public interface is because you've really got vector doing two jobs. It's providing all the nice vector interface and it's managing memory. Maybe something else should be managing that memory. So you refactor that out into something else. Uh-oh. Oh, there we go, good. Um, you refactor it out into something else um, I called it array storage here. That's not the right term for this. Go see David's talk the other day for the what this really is. Um, the point is, it should have a public capacity. You can unit test that. Vector has one. Vector doesn't need the public interface. Now, I think we'd probably agree that this is actually better than plan B, right? This is This is a nice situation to end up in. The problem, is that it's a whole lot of work to do, and it's very intrusive. You are making big changes to your code base to do this, and it's legacy code. You're making big changes without having unit tests to provide a safety net. If you had the unit test, this would all have stopped at plan A. You might do this, maybe there's some other way to test it or something, but it's risky and there's lots of good reasons to not want to go there. Now at this point, things start to get ugly. Plan A ablated, plan B took a bullet, plan C's out of ammo. We are now going to start throwing our philosophical principles out the window. We're gonna white box test. We're gonna throw out the idea that you're gonna use behavior driven design and test behaviors rather than implementation. You're going to throw out the idea that you test only using the public interface. Um, there's two ways to do this. So we've got two plan D's. All right, plan D1, is uh, you can see on line five there, um, we've changed the access specifier for our capacity data, which means that in your unit test, you can inherit from vector, write your unit tests in terms of your test thing, and it can reach in and get to it. So now you have access to the inner guts. Um, 
Now there's some obvious reasons why you don't like this. Aside from the fact that it's white box and you have now just vastly increased your maintenance burden, right? Now at some point in your unit tests, capacity underscore exists, which means if you change vector and you rename it, you have to go touch your unit tests, which can be extremely expensive to do. Um, but you've also done something to your code. I mean, it's a minor change, it's one line. That is not a minor change to your code. If this is at the top of a big inheritance hierarchy, you have just radically changed some things about the architecture of your code. How safe is that to do? I don't know, I don't like it. I don't like this option. Um, I think this option gets used more in other languages, like maybe um, Java or Smalltalk or like purely object-oriented languages might go for this if they really have to. Um, wouldn't be my first thing to go to, but it's a possibility, maybe it works. Um, plan D2, which I like better, is that you leave the thing alone and you add a friend class. Um, what we're doing now is giving access to a trusted friend, which is the right way to break encapsulation. Friends are there to break encapsulation. That's what they're for. They break encapsulation, but only for specific other trusted people. So now what you do is you make a class in your unit test that, for example, takes a vector by reference, stores the reference, it's a friend, it can go into the thing it's got a reference to and get all kinds of internal goodies and present them to your unit test. And this is nice, it doesn't affect the design, and it breaks encapsulation, but not in a way that anybody cares about. Probably. There's a red question mark on the end. Um, first of all, I know that a lot of people think that friends are a terrible idea, they shouldn't be in the language, it's a blight upon the landscape, or at least it's a uh, code smell if you've got friends in your classes. Um, without getting into that debate, they might be right. This is plan D2. A code smell is just fine, right? This is not the worst thing we've done so far, okay? Um, I don't think this introduces like security problems. I could be wrong about that. I don't know much about security. Um, there are some rare cases well, you can't do this. And um, these are rare, but they happen. Maybe you can't change the source code at all. Maybe you've got legal or regulatory issues. Maybe it's a customer or company policy, thou shalt not touch that header file. Or maybe you don't have the source code. How many of you work on a system where some part of that system exists as a compiled thing and you no longer have the source code? Anybody got that? I see a couple of hands. Right? It is bonkers, but it is not impossible. Um, now what? We are now going to white box test in anger. We are now going to commit an act of aggressive unit testing. We're gonna define private, public, and do it anyway. I know. I know. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yes, we're invoking undefined behavior on the first line of our unit test suite. I know. Again, go see talks earlier this week about all the horrors of unit testing. I will just point out two things. It doesn't change the source code, and it probably works. I tried this a long time ago and it worked. I tried it the other night and it worked. GCC, as it happens, only, and I suspect other compilers, I don't know, maybe there's a compiler guy in the room. Um, it uses the access specifiers during compilation to see if you can call a function, but it doesn't incorporate that into the name mangling scheme, which means you can do this and you can link against an already existing library and it works and it's probably pretty reliable. I know, I know. Now, I gave this talk to our local uh, North Denver Metro C++ meetup a couple of months ago, and I, that, that, right there. And I expected to get a certain amount of abuse for this because like, this is not good. This is why we've got red lights on, right? Nothing good is gonna come of this. And I expected to get some grief. Instead, a couple of maniacs went off into the chat and pointed out all the other ways where this isn't enough. What if, 
we didn't have the private keyword there. What if capacity was private because that is the default behavior for vector? <sighs> yeah. I know. It works. GCC will let you do this. I'm not saying it's a good idea, right? But when your back is up against the wall, you're already desperate. You might have to go there. Now, I know how horrible this is. True story. Project we just finished up at SciTech. Legacy system that we got from another company, don't ask. Half a million lines of code, we'd never seen it before. A big chunk of stuff in the middle had no source code. All we got were pre-compiled executables and libraries. It's probably all Fortran code, we don't know. But we did get some of the libraries that it depends on and we would have liked to put bug fixes in those libraries. The point at which you're having a serious discussion with the customer about reverse compiling pieces of the Fortran in the thing so that you can relink them against a changed thing, this doesn't look so bad to me. I would have taken this in a heartbeat. This was not the worst thing we talked about that day. Okay, I wanna get that off the screen because that slide had more undefined behavior on it per pixel than everything else at this conference put together, right? I don't wanna see it anymore. Um, so, how did we get, how did we get into the situation? Um, well, test-driven development and all the other good advice didn't work. Uh, we couldn't redesign for testability and add the thing into the public interface. We were unwilling to refactor it because it was risky. Um, we didn't like uh, white box testing plan one, which is make the thing protected and inherit. For some reason, we didn't like plan two, which is add a friend class, use that to test. Um, we needed to go to something where we couldn't, or it didn't have to change the source code at all. So define private, public, and damn the torpedoes. Off we go. If that doesn't work, I'm out of ideas. We go to Plan Omega. We abandon the unit test. We've got time left. Any questions at this point? Or do you just want to get up and throw things at me for suggesting something so horrible? I'm prepared to dodge. <laughs> Anything online? Okay. Um, what is Plan Omega? We, every time we've gone through this, we get at some point where I got no more good notions about what to do next. So now you're just gonna give up and say we're not gonna unit test it. This is not great. It's not failure. Okay, remember that all of our testing frameworks are just, it, it, this is defense in depth, right? Code reviews aren't gonna catch all the bugs. They're not really to catch bugs at all, but they will catch some bugs. But they're not gonna catch all of them. You run the unit tests. Unit tests catch some bugs. You don't expect your unit tests to catch all bugs, not in real life. So you're gonna have component testing, integration, system testing, whatever, whatever all the other layers of defense you've got. You just need to beef those up because your unit tests aren't gonna do it. And so you can do acceptance testing. See, uh, Claire's talk two years ago on, except she's got a nice framework for acceptance testing and a lot of good ideas about how to do that. Acceptance testing is, I don't know what it does. I'm going to assume it's right. I'm gonna feed some stuff in. I'm gonna grab what comes out and that's my test. Now I can go fiddle with it and I can watch what comes out and see if it changes. This ain't great but it works. That's what we ended up doing on that project I was just describing. We just did vast amounts of acceptance testing. Um, also, keep in mind, if you didn't know about them, hopefully everyone here has heard this over and over again, but maybe some people out there in YouTube land, hi everybody, uh, maybe some of you don't know about sanitizers, this wonderful thing. Clang uh, has these, they've been ported to GCC, other compilers have them. Um, if you're a Linux person, this is the equivalent of building Valgrind into the executable. The executable gets instrumented so that you run it under normal circumstances, there's some runtime and memory overhead. It detects problems while it's running. These are fantastic. I love these things. Build your unit test with these and run your unit test with these all the time. That's just a standard thing. Make sure that your component and system tests are doing this too. Beef up 
your component testing because your unit tests simply aren't possible in the current state of affairs. Um, so to wrap this up, we can't test this is failure. But it's almost never true. We started with plan A, we went through a horror show, we got to plan omega. My point is that the plan that is no tests does not exist. That is the no plan. Don't dereference that. Now, you didn't like where we got to in the middle. And it may feel like you are now two kilometers below what used to be the surface of an alien planet and you're calling in close air support and it can get to you. And this is not a healthy environment to live in, but it's an option. If we've learned anything over the past, what, 15 or 20 years of testing, it's that if you're not testing, you're gonna fail, right? This is not an optional thing. Again, go see David's talk last night, which is about sort of the, well, among many things, the ethics of not having really solid code. You have to test or it's going to fail. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when, probably next Thursday. So you're gonna to have to test it somehow. Hopefully this gives you enough ideas to come up with some plans, bad plans, so that when you go forth, you've got plans to deal with what's inevitably gonna happen when you hit the real world. Go out, make your plans, and just make a lot of them because it's hot out there. Thank you very much. We have time for questions and screams of outrage. Uh, I refuse to believe that I can put that up at CPPCon and not get grief from somebody. Anything from online? David. Great talk, thank you. Um, two comments uh, with regard to the flaky test issue, which we all have. Um, one of them is that it's interesting to take a play from the, uh, the SRE runbook, which is to say, if you're going to have a test in your code base, it needs uh, to have a 90% reliability, 99% reliability, 99.9, .9. otherwise we will take it out. And that's the agreement that we have between us and you in order to be able to get a test into our code base. Yeah. Um, and we found that to be pretty useful. Yeah, nice. Um, the second one is when it comes to the decision of whether or not to pull out a flaky test, um, because of sunk cost fallacy, it's useful to flip it around and say, well, let's say we didn't have this test in the system and someone is proposing we add this test knowing that it's flaky. Would we accept that? Mm. If the answer is no, then it should be the same decision about you know, just removing the test from the code base. Right, right. No, that's an excellent idea. The other way to phrase that, which I found useful, is to ask what people are gonna bet that it's okay anyway. Would you bet today's lunch that you could deploy this? Would you bet a week's lunch? Would you bet your life, <laughs> right? That's yet another way of getting people to put value on these to see, do you really wanna go do it or are, do you really not wanna go do it? Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Any other comments? Uh, Michael. Yes. <laughs> uh, like to say uh, from uh, another perspective, like uh, as developer, now we want to have a good uh, unit test but how do we design our class or our code, write our code to make it more unit testable and not creating this kind of uh, complexity? Comment on that? Right, so that's an excellent, arguably I should have given that talk and it's more useful for, than this one, but not quite as applicable for Halloween. Um, <laughs> so the real answer is go watch I don't know, it was five or six talks from last year. There was a whole uh, track at CPPCon on testing. And all the people giving talks there, aside from me, uh, had given a lot of other talks in different contexts. Go see Phil Nash. There are talks after talks after talks at previous CPPCons, uh, ACCU, all the, other, all the other stuff. Just go on YouTube and look for it. 
Um, Michael Feather's book is about legacy code, but he's got a lot of good ideas. Um, there's an enormous amount of training and books and blog posts out there that amount to plan A. Don't make it complex in the first place, right? Which is really, now, test-driven development is harder than it looks. I don't know how many of you have tried it, and I don't know how many of you have tried it and backed off because you couldn't quite, right? It isn't just write the test first. Um, but if you take the approach that I'm not going to write it unless I can test it thoroughly, that actually solves a lot of this because it makes you think about whether you can test it up front, so, which means you never get into complicated, well, not never, we know what happens in real life. Much less frequently you get into, you can a lot of the easy, pro easy problems, common problems, you can avoid if you never get there in the first place, which is easy when you're writing new code. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the answer is go, go read the books, go read the blogs, go listen to the talks, go look at all that. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, hi. Um, so I'm curious of your thoughts about uh, how plans B through Omega um, impact <laughs> the likelihood of actually refactoring some of this code, which could be refactored to use plan A. If we put in a Band-Aid solution like plan E, right. um, what is the likelihood, or what kind of impact do you see on people just having that be good enough? Ah, right, the good enough problem. Um, hopefully that last plan is so horrible that your developers are screaming up and down and threatening bloody murder. Um, the other point, it, particularly with legacy code, uh, and again, this gets back to the earlier talks this week, um, a lot of this is, a, it really is a temporary band-aid, like, like the, the non-horrible white box. You can't test the damn thing until you change it, but you can't change the damn thing until you got tests. So you go in and you white box it temporarily. Now you can refactor it. Then you can refactor the unit test to not be white box. And we change the lights back to green and everybody's happy. Um, yeah, the problem is either A, like in that uh, the situation I described, you're stuck with it forever. Um, or Convincing management that you've got something that works but everybody hates it and you really need to do something about it is, <laughs> I don't have a plan for that, <laughs> right? I need one, so do the rest of us. Um, but I, in principle, maybe you can do this on the basis that you can't compile that unless you turn off half the warnings in your compiler and all your quality checkers. So if, if you have a situation where you have to do static analysis scans, which I think most people do, right, you static analysis tools on your code is part of the pipeline. Hopefully they scream about this. If a, if a code quality tool doesn't have something to complain about in that last one, then I don't know. And then you explicitly have some big thing somewhere in a document saying, hey, we had to turn off all the safety checks to do this. You're gonna want us to turn those back on. So, so would you then recommend that you don't go into plans see through Omega without an explicit plan of refactoring. Maybe these yes. are temporary changes. Right, uh, yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. That's an excellent point. If you're gonna have to go into the horribleness, have a plan to get back out. How many horror movies go badly because they didn't do that, right? So, yeah. Make sure the door doesn't close and lock behind you. Um, do you have questions from online audience? Oh, online. So the first one from James Irwin. So what are your thoughts on amending the C++ standard in some way to make testing easier? Easier. Um, well, I'd love it. Uh, we now know that testing is as fundamental a part of what we do as writing a for loop. Okay, maybe not. Um, so I'd love to see support in the language. I haven't the faintest idea what it would look like. Um, I mean, the first thing that we all hate about our unit test frameworks, most of our unit test frameworks, is that they're all full of macros. I mean, they're horrible things. Try to debug something that goes wrong in an assert if true macro, right? That's getting better. Uh, he's now given a couple of talks now. Chris Jusiak, I think he gave one this week that I couldn't make, where he's got a unit test framework built in C++ 20 that's pretty full featured, no macros. As soon as we get introspection, 
That actually might answer that question because then it is gonna be so much easier to do all this. You can write automated stuff to go do stuff. Beyond that, I'd love to see it. I don't know what it looks like. So if someone out there's got a good idea, yes, please. Thank you, and one more question. Is there any workable, <clears throat> workable plan to revive disabled test? It seems like you are already at the last resort of disabling them. The, to, to revive the what? I didn't catch that. To revive disabled tests. I don't know what a disabled... I'm, Oh, yeah, so most unit test frameworks have a way to go in and in one way or another say don't run this, don't run this by default, you can run it by doing something special. Um, so and coming, coming back to, to, to that earlier point, maybe one of the things you do if you use that to disable your tests, you rig up some scanner that every week it mails a really strongly worded letter to someone saying these are the disabled tests do you want to think about that? So that's, that's not a bad idea. Most unit test frameworks have that. For bigger things like compound, I have had, oh, it was not a good situation. Um, we had a whole suite of system level tests that we were told by management to turn off. Some of them really were of negative value. That's that case before. That did not end well either, but yeah, um, I won't go into that. We'll, we won't, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we won't embarrass the guilty parties. But um, yeah, that's an option. And it would, it's probably necessary for a good testing framework to have a way to do that, even temporarily. Look, we know it's broken, give us 10 minutes, but you can keep moving. Question over here, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, great talk. I think between, between your talk and Brian Ruth's talk, it sort of you know, nailed home the point that you can always test your code. There is always a way. Um, so my question is, how would you suggest approaching coverage? There are lots of different ways of uh, measuring coverage. Um, <clears throat> and when you start with like, well, we have some amount of coverage in our code base and we need to increment that, what's the strategy you would go for for prioritizing that? So, um, yeah, so tools exist, GCOV, LCOV, that stuff. Um, I hear from like people working on self-driving cars and such, they've got tests, I, it, which might be those tools, I haven't, I haven't used them in a while, which actually sounds horrible given the talk I just gave, um, that they can do not just coverage of lines of code, but coverage on branches, right, and all that stuff. Uh, I understand that like in, in the automotive industry, you have to prove that your tests cover every branch, which is, by the way, a really good reason not to white box test, because man, if you have to go in and change your unit tests, how expensive is it to go back and do all that? Um, in real, <laughs> In real life on the stuff I tend to work on, which is really important, um, realistically, I think something like 90% coverage, I, I hate to put down a number, and the reason is that you always want it to get better, but there are cases where you just can't test that because you have to run your tests with an optimizer turned on for it to run in a reasonable amount of time, and that line of code went away and you can't get the thing to tell you that you ran it. So I think that's an engineering trade-off um, there were some talks, and I'm drawing a total blank on the guy's name. It was at C++ Now earlier this year. He's, he's got this sort of code hotspot analyzer where it looks at, it, it looks through your Git history and finds the stuff that's changing the most, and then it runs code complexity analysis and finds the stuff that's most complex. And when those overlap, he's got a thing that says, go, go do this. If you've got one of those, and I wanna, I wanna play with his tools, when your code coverage says you're missing stuff there, that's where you start. Other than that, you probably start with the stuff that from some point of view is the most dangerous if it doesn't work. Even if you know it works, because it's been running for years, the stuff that, I don't know, makes the wings stay on or something, whatever it is, start with that stuff, not the thing that formats your logger. Thank you. One more question. Oh, certainly. From my audience. How often and to what extent do you implement unit tests for third-party code you use? Ah. Or your hope and dreams are to capture failure based, failure based on the unit tests you have for your code base? That's a good question. Okay, in principle, in that world we started with when the lights were green, you don't have to write any unit tests for all the third-party stuff because of course they've tested it. Um, Whoops, uh oh, am I losing? 
Yeah. All right. Yeah. It, what, yeah. Um, not a bad idea. First question, how much do you trust him? Second question, how bad does it catch on fire if that's what fails? What you should do, um, Titus Winters tends to talk about this in the huge, vast, enormous Google thing. Um, you should certainly write unit tests around the code that you write that uses their thing so that if they change what their thing does, your stuff doesn't break, and if it does, you know. Right? This is where Hiram's law shows up over there. Someone makes some totally innocuous change to something, and all these other tests break because that changes some obscure internal state no one should have been looking at, but these people down there were depending on it. That's Hiram's law. So you should absolutely test the code around where you're using their stuff. It is not unrealistic, particularly when you're tracking down a bug. You're having one of those Heisen bug uncertainty days where it's only broken for you and everybody else is good, right? We've all had those. To start, yeah, start unit testing their code, maybe in the middle of one of your unit tests, don't leave it there. Very imprecise tool you end up with. Because at the end of the day, maybe it is a bug in their code. Um, the only other thing I can say there is that if you find a bug in their code, keep that unit test, but factor it out and stick it someplace, platform or wherever your directory for handling platform and compiler and operate, operating stuff, whatever that is, put a unit test in there. It breaks if there's something wrong with your dependencies. It isn't really a unit test for your code, but it's nice to have around. Yeah, good, good question. Yes, sir. Uh, this is a great talk, thanks. Um, quick question on, probably not a quick answer though. <laughs> How would you, or what do you recommend um, to, to kind of talk people into actually doing unit testing? I've been trying to do it for years and uh, struggle with actually getting people that aren't accustomed to doing unit testing or test-driven development to even start and try. <sighs> yeah, it's a public forum. So, my first thought of a big stick is probably not work appropriate. Um, I am tempted. The long discussion I had with, with Pete Muldoon, which led to me totally dumping the middle third of my talk, um, a whole lot of that sort of kind of centered around it isn't that people don't want to test, it's just really hard. But there are times when you need to go have a chat with someone and say, what are you doing? Now, you can do a lot with the process in your organization, most of us are probably doing Agile of some description. You've got product owners, you've got managers. If you write into your process or you get your managers to jump up and down about saying, if it does not have a test with X percent code coverage, for example, it's not going in. And yes, that's gonna slow your team down. And yes, you don't get to close those stories. And your velocity goes down and you've got points rolling over to the next sprint and everything's on fire, but we're not taking it. Because again, that is the, that, is that up? Yeah. That is the no test option. That is the null option. And if you let that happen, it's going to fail. Now, a lot of us have gotten away with this for a long time. Anyone who's got any amount of gray hair, we used to do everything like this. Don't, don't tell all the young'uns, right? But, um, I mean, there's a reason why legacy code looks the way it looks. That's what we built back in the day. So, it isn't that you can't make stuff that apparently works. Sure looks like it works. You go through your system testing, you put it out in the field, hey, look, it works. Um, if you don't have all the tests, no, that isn't it works. That's it probably works. It apparently seems to be working now because we're lucky. And at some point you gotta hold the line. And um, I'm joking about the big stick. <laughs> Maybe I'm not joking much. The, the things you can do to help though, I mean more productively. Um, training, a lot, so first of all, a lot of people don't like writing unit tests. And so you might need something in the culture of your team that says, look, we all gotta go write the unit test. It's your turn today, sorry pal, right? Um, if, if you write the unit tests, someone else buys the donuts, you know, you can do things. Um, but training helps a lot because it isn't as usual. I mean, okay, this was extreme situations. On a day-to-day -day basis, it's not that hard. Or if it is hard, it, you actually realize it's part of your job to figure out how to do that anyway. Um, so training, also good tools, 
Oh, and I think we are, oof, <laughs> we got 28 seconds. True story. I've been this open, I've been the unit test evangelist for no good reason, way back when. So at a small startup, we had a math library that had been written by a bunch of math graduate students. It was the thing that the whole company relied on. I found a bug. People freaked because everyone was here. No, that math library, we've checked that. No, you missed the thing. So I had never seen a unit test framework. So I did the same thing everyone else does the first time you write a unit test framework. I wrote an absolutely god awful, horrible unit test framework. And it had vast amounts of boilerplate, you know, 30 lines to set up to assert that true is true, right? Um, so I put that in place around the thing, fine. Left the company for about two years, came back. You know how many unit tests have been written? None. That code had not been touched. But in that time, I'd found out about this cool thing called unit testing with good frameworks, and I had found this cool thing called boost test, which I'm still very fond of. And I put that in, and it was amazing. People started writing unit tests because you can assert that true is true in one line of code. So I will say the other thing is make sure that there are no barriers. Um, when we inherited this half million line of code project, one of the first things I did was write a script that found every .h file and made a shell for the unit test in the right directory for where the unit tests were that included that file and asserted true with a comment, please write some unit tests. On the basis that if you ever needed to, there was zero overhead. The file was there, it was in the build system. Writing that true is true is five seconds. And that's the other really important thing you can do to help is you make it easy. All right, we are out of time. Uh, thank you so much.